Okay, so I would like to introduce our guest speaker for our webinar today. Tasha Murray is the Executive Director of the Invasive Species Council of Metro Vancouver. She's been with that organization since wow, 2008, so I believe, Tasha, you told me. Um, she holds a Bachelor of Science in Ecology and Environmental Biology and also a Master's of Science in Teaching. She has spent the last 15 years working um, on conservation and extensively to manage invasive plants. So without further ado, I would like to turn the webinar over to Tasha Murray. Great, thank you so much for inviting me. I'm excited to be with all of you. So I am currently in my office in Vancouver on the South Coast. And um, I'm sorry that you guys are dealing with knotweed as we are here on the South Coast, but I hope that some of my experience and knowledge will be helpful for you as you tackle the knotweed in your area. So here's what I'd like to cover tonight. Um, just basically what is an invasive species? Oftentimes when I do these presentations, I'm trying to cram in information on a number of different species, but it's great today that we're really just focusing on knotweed. Although some of the information that I'll share will hold true for some of the other species that you might be battling as well. So I'm gonna really focus a lot on knotweed. Why is it that we care? What are some of the impacts knotweeds are having? How to identify them? A summary of different options. So from recommended options to options that are either not available or not recommended and why that is. And we'll talk a little bit about monitoring and restoration. So what do we do after we've treated our knotweed? and then disposal. Um, and of course, because I'm from the Metro Vancouver region, a lot of my information is specific to my region, but um, Lori and her colleagues have helped me populate the presentation to include local information. And I invite any of the local staff also to jump in um, and correct me or make additions to what I'm talking about so that it's super relevant for where you guys are in your area. And finally, some tips and resources, and we'll end with question and answer. So. I've spent a lot of my career dealing with knotweed. And in fact, this photo on the slide is of my neighborhood. And it's probably kind of hard to see in the screenshot there, but there's three children walking on the road. Those are my children walking to school. Um, this is not my property. This is about a kilometer away, but it's on our way to our local elementary school. So I deal with knotweed in my job. Um, I don't have it on my property, but it's certainly very uh, prolific in my neighborhood and in the South Coast region. So it is a, a daily um, species in my mindset. I'm always thinking about knotweed and working a lot with people on how to manage their knotweed. Um, so I have lots and lots of experience that I'm hoping to share. So I just wanna step back and talk about what an invasive species is because knotweed is an invasive. And, and why do we care about that? So an invasive species is really one that's come from somewhere else on earth. So it, it's living outside its natural range and it's causing some kind of significant harm, maybe economic harm, harm to human health or environmental harm. And it turns out that the knotweeds actually fall under all three of those categories, which I'll talk about in a minute. Um, so if you imagine a species like knotweed, it actually evolved as a first colonizing plant in regions in Asia, and suddenly it finds itself in a new environment, say North America, say the Central Kootenays. Um, oftentimes these introduced species don't have any natural controls or competition, and if they're able to reproduce, they're often able to do so without any viruses or funguses or predators that would um, keep the population at a more natural level in the native environment. So essentially, they're able to grow without any you know, competition or controls. And while we're focusing on knotweed today, which is obviously a plant, invasive species can cover any range of living things. There are lots of examples of insects, um, invasive amphibians. You can see an American bullfrog on there, which definitely is a problem for the Kootenays. Um, so there's lots and lots of examples of different invasive things that we deal with. But knotweed is something really special. The knotweeds are actually considered one of the world's worst 100 invasive species worldwide. So they're invasive to BC, to Canada. They're actually invasive in many different parts of the world and they're an extremely aggressive kind of species. And this picture really tells the story 
of how challenging knotweed is to deal with. It's not just your average kind of backyard weed. It takes a lot of um, specific knowledge and information in order to know what to do when you're dealing with a knotweed infestation. So um, this fellow here has discovered knotweed on his property and little does he know, um, it's really bad news for him, but there's lots that he can do about it. And there's lots that you can do as well if you're finding yourself troubled by knotweed. Um, but make no mistake, it is one of the world's worst invasive species, and we really do have to pay special attention to how we manage it. So some of the impacts that knotweeds are having, I'm going to start with environmental. So much like many invasive species, knotweeds simply take over space for our native plants. So they displace other types of vegetation and often create what we call monocultures, where you have little else growing out of sight. So you can see some of the photos here of the damage that knotweed has done. It lowers biodiversity, which means it decreases the number of species that are available and can grow at a site. The knotweeds provide really very little habitat or food value. Um, so they just don't provide the same amount of um, benefit as a native stand of you know, multiple shrubs and trees growing together. Um, and knotweeds also erode shoreline, so they're particularly devastating in aquatic environments, say growing along a stream side or a river, as in the photo there. Knotweeds are also notorious for damaging infrastructure, so they're extremely aggressive plants. The, the rhizomes or the root structure underneath the ground can actually damage concrete walls, it can grow through pavement, it can damage building and bridge foundations. You can see in the bottom right there, the photo of knotweed growing over a pipeline. Um, if you're charged with managing that pipeline, you wouldn't want knotweed growing over top of it because it could potentially actually impact the infrastructure underneath the ground. And all of these things come at an economic cost as well. So if you have knotweed on your property, it is gonna be cost there's going to be a cost associated with you managing it. Um, there's a cost um, for people like me and Laurie and Erin who focus our jobs on invasive species. In my region alone, the estimate is $660,000 is spent uh, annually managing knotweeds on um, local government property. So that doesn't include any um, private property work. So it is definitely the highest priority species in my region. It is what everybody is spending the most amount of money on and it is what most people are, are really concerned about. Um, a few other impacts, there are some health and safety impacts simply because of how aggressive knotweed can grow. So if it's growing along a highway or a trail, it can actually um, cause what we call a line of sight issue where it might obstruct the vision of the drivers or it might um, decrease park safety if it's growing along trails and it's making people feel unsafe. Um, and also, again, it can impact infrastructure if it's growing next to a bridge footing, which is as shown in the photo here, that can eventually impact safety as well if it's um, a piece of infrastructure that humans have to use and if it has to be maintained properly. Um, so lots of different ways that uh, knotweed is um, impacting our everyday lives. And how does it spread? So it actually spreads in a number of different ways. This is a, a photo of a different invasive plant um, for sale there. I haven't actually seen knotweed for sale in nurseries and garden centers, but I have known gardeners to sell them at you know, garden club events or to trade them amongst themselves. And so knotweed definitely can be spread through the horticulture industry. You can be watching for that. Um, you can see a little hanging basket there on the upper right, um, people inappropriately disposing of yard waste is one of the ways that knotweed can be spread. Um, sometimes our own maintenance activities can spread knotweed, so it spreads really easily by parts of the stem and root fragment, and so um, we don't want people mowing it or cutting it in such a way that it can actually increase the spread of the infestation or spread it to a new infestation. So it's why groups like ours do a lot of training with staff who work outdoors because we want them to be aware of the species and what to do and what not to do. Um, because it can spread in little 
fragments of the plant. Um, we have to be really careful about movement of soil or other materials that could be contaminated with knotweed parts. Um, and in the case of one of our knotweed species, Bohemia knotweed, it can actually spread by seed. So if we have those seeds on the bottom of our shoes or maybe on our pets or our gear and we're moving from one site to another, we could potentially be spreading the seeds as well as the plant parts. Um, so unfortunately, yeah, we have to really pay attention to how those kinds of things are moving around because humans are actually one of the main um, causes for spread of knotweed in regions. So a few knotweed facts. It is an escaped ornamental originating from Eastern Asia and they will really grow anywhere. They'll grow in many different types of habitats. They will tolerate full sun to semi shade. They can grow in really uh, poor soil and nutrient conditions. Um, I mentioned that they grow really, really quickly and they have this, these rhizomes, a root structure that can extend three meters deep and 20 meters laterally. So sometimes people use the metaphor of when you see a knotweed plant, what you see is only the tip of the iceberg. When you can picture a knotweed plant like the ones in the photo, imagine an even larger structure underneath the ground that we can't see. Um, so that's really why these plants are so aggressive as they have these extensive root system underneath the ground that's just, um, yeah, basically the, the storehouse of the plant. Um, and it can re-sprout after many years of control. And um, again, small little pieces can regrow into a new plant. Um, and for all these reasons, knotweed is notoriously difficult to control. Um, there's been lots of studies and trials over many decades and in BC we're figuring out what are the best methods to deal with it because again it's not just a regular invasive plant or your regular garden weed. We have to pay special attention to how we manage knotweed. We actually have four species of knotweed in, in BC and there's a picture of four of them up at the top there. So we have Japanese knotweed which is a little bit smaller. And we have giant knotweed, as the name implies, it's quite a, a large plant with very large leaves. And then Japanese and giant knotweed can reproduce and the hybrid of their reproduction is called Bohemian knotweed. And incidentally, Japanese knotweed and giant knotweed do not produce seeds that will um, turn into new plants, but they're um, the offspring, the hybrid, the Bohemian knotweed does produce viable seed. And so we really do need to pay attention to not only um, preventing the spread of the plant parts, but also the seeds, because if you have Bohemian knotweed, you don't want it to spread by seed. And then we also have Himalayan knotweed. I don't think you guys have very much Himalayan knotweed. I don't have very much Himalayan knotweed in my region either. If you want more information about how to identify these down to species, there's a little diagram there. Um, the leaf shape and the leaf size is very um, indicative. And also the hairs on the underside of the veins of the leaves, which you would need a hand lens or a microscope to see, can also be very distinguishing. Um, one of the main distinguishing features of the knotweeds, I'm just gonna try and get my laser pointer to show here for you. Um, in this picture right here, you can see that the leaves come off the stem um, in opposite locations. So they don't come off the stem at the same point. You have a leaf at the top and then a little ways down you have a leaf coming off the other side and then a little ways down a leaf coming off the other side and it sort of um, appears like they're coming off the leaf in kind of a, a zigzag fashion. And that's very distinctive for all of the knotweeds. Um, and and while for some purposes it might be important to distinguish down to species for most people, including myself, um, it's important just to know that it's a knotweed and they're all very damaging and they're all managed in similar ways. And so from here on in, I'm just gonna collectively refer to them as the knotweeds. And the knotweeds are perennial species, which means an individual plant lives for more than one year. And it's really interesting to note how they change throughout the year. You can actually do plant identification in the winter when plants are dead. So you can get to know what knotweed looks like throughout the year. So in the early spring, as the knotweed shoots are popping up, they kind of look like little pink lipstick tubes. And then around now in the springtime, you see these large, um, you know, seedlings kind of popping through the ground. Sometimes people um, mistakenly identify knotweed as a bamboo because it sort of has a very similar looking stem. They're hollow and they are um, grown in kind of little segments. 
And then in the early summer, um, you start to see all the foliage or the leaves come out. And then in the late summer, you'll start to see the flowers form. Um, the flowers are kind of like little sprays of white, tiny flowers that emerge from the stem at the same place where the leaves come off. And then be, because they, um, the stems don't persist throughout the winter, it looks dead, just like this last photo here during those winter months. Um, however, because I remember that underground root structure um, persists year after year, that material is still alive. It's just sort of hibernating underneath the ground. It's only the above ground material that dies off. Um, but in this photo right here, um, whenever it was taken, that plant is still alive. You just don't see any of the living material because it's underneath the ground. Um, but really at all these different stages, knotweed is pretty distinctive from all other kinds of plants. So how much knotweed do you have? This is a snapshot of the entire region. And you can see that you do have quite a bit of knotweed. And these are all of the known sites. Um, probably not all of the private property sites are captured here, um, but there's lots of stuff happening in this photo here. And so this is kind of a comparison. If you can think of where you have some knotweed sites in the region, um, you can compare this to here. But if you're aware of knotweed sites that haven't been mapped yet, we'll give some information a little bit later on about how you can report those. So a little bit about the legislation. All four of the knotweed species are considered noxious weeds in all regions of the province under the BC Weed Control Act. So technically, according to law, any land manager that has these one of these four species on their property is required to manage it. The Japanese and giant knotweeds are also listed under other bodies of legislation in the province. I um, also want to mention locally, the city of Rossland has a, a bylaw requiring all property owners to ensure that their land is free from knotweed. And to assist with knotweed eradication or um, knotweed removal, the city of Rossland offers a rebate of 50% uh, of the total cost of treatment up to $400. So for those land managers who are conducting herbicide control of their knotweed, there is that cost share program available for residents of the, the city of Rossland. So I'm going to kind of run through some of the main ways that invasive plants can be managed with respect to what works and what doesn't work for knotweed. And so prevention is really the most economical and effective way to reduce the spread um, of knotweed over the long term. So we talk about prevention in terms of we want to prevent the further spread of the knotweed we have and we want to prevent the new introductions of knotweed so that we don't um, we don't have any more accumulating in the region. So some of the um, imperative prevention measures are avoiding activity or disturbance near knotweed. Um, also, because we just talked about how plant parts and seeds can spread by movement, we want to make sure that we're inspecting our gear and any source material. So anytime you're introducing something to your property, whether it's a potted plant or soil, those things could potentially be infested with invasive plant material, including knotweeds. Of course, don't purchase, trade, or grow knotweed. Um, and just to mention, anytime we're doing an invasive plant project, especially when it comes to the knotweeds, expect a long-term commitment. Um, it'd be very, very rare that somebody would provide a treatment at a site only once and the site to be eradicated or the plant to be um, totally removed afterwards. Oftentimes with knotweed, you have to do multiple treatments for multiple years and then still be monitoring and checking back on the site for many, many years later. So definitely expect a long-term commitment. It definitely is possible to eradicate knotweed. Um, and depending how old and how big the site is, it might take quite a long time. And I'll talk a little bit later about how monitoring is really essential too, because sometimes you can think that you've eradicated your knotweed and then it surprises you a couple of years later and actually comes back. So around the province and in your region, there is some prevention signage that's happening to help alert people to the fact that this invasive species exists. And so this is an example of a poster that is at work in your region alerting people to invasive knotweed and what to do if they find it with some photos there. 
Um, on the, the photo on the right hand side, you can see this attention invasive plant sign. And this is really considered a, a do not mow sign. So it's often installed in front of or around invasive plant infestations that we do not want mowed. And this is certainly the case with the knotweeds. I'll explain a little bit in a minute why it's not appropriate to mow this species. But if you ever see this sign along highways or roadsides in the region, you know that it's been installed as a prevention measure because we want to alert people that are working along that roadside on um, what is appropriate um, practice around those infestations. Another really important prevention method is to use best practices. So when we're trying to deal with our invasive plants, it really does matter what specific plant you're dealing with. So this goes for any invasive plant or species that you're dealing with. It's important to confirm your identification and it's important that you know how to manage that particular species properly. Um, and so often there are specific resources for the particular species that you're working on. And so a lot of the information that I'm providing tonight on knotweed is available in a best management practices guide for knotweed species for the Metro Vancouver region that my group developed a number of years ago. So in the email follow up, there'll be the enormous link for this resource. But if you wanted to find it really quickly, if you visit metrovancouver.org and search invasive species, you'll have access to a number of these different guides. But in particular, I draw your attention to the one about the knotweed. Um, everything and more you wanted to know about managing knotweed, you could find in that guide. Of course, some of the information would be specific to my region about exactly where it's been found and some of the facilities where you can um, you know, get support. Um, so some of that local information will be relevant to you, but the core of the document, um, some of that information about best practices would, would certainly be relevant for you as well. So I'm gonna run through some of the most common methods um, that we use to manage invasives and, and mention how or they, how they are or are not appropriate for, for knotweed. And so oftentimes as homeowners, as gardeners, we, we start with manual or mechanical control, right? That's physically killing um, or removing plants. That's you know the most basic sort of weeding techniques that we use. Um, this, however, is a method that we really have to use with caution when it comes to the knotweeds because they will spread so easily um, if you cut them or if you're digging them or pulling or smothering them or, or mowing them or using some kind of machine. Um, we really only use this on a really case-by-case -case basis. So if it's an emergency situation or perhaps if there are no other methods that you can use, um, we might consider using manual or mechanical methods. But on their own, these methods are not effective and they come at really great risk of not only encouraging the plant to come back more aggressively, but also spreading the infestation. Um, and so this is really important. It's one of the reasons why we have the do not mow signs because people whose job it is to manage roadsides and trails, we don't want them to use their regular um, mowing methods or manual control methods to manage knotweed because it simply won't work and it'll likely make the infestation worse. And unfortunately in my region, you know, five, 10 years ago, we have um, sites where this was done a lot. There's a lot of evidence where our own maintenance activities actually cause the spread of the knotweed. Um, and so certainly on your property, if you're dealing with, um, with knotweed, um, this is a control method that we, we don't recommend, um, except under very specific circumstances. So chemical control or the use of herbicides to kill uh, plants is really the most recommended method. And so herbicides are specifically designed to kill plants and there are lots of different classes of herbicides and they all work in, in slightly different ways. But the general idea is that however they are applied to the plant, they are absorbed by the plant cells and it is moved throughout the plant. And so it will kill um, sort of the plant from the inside out. And so the benefit of using chemical control is that it's applied to the above ground vegetation, but it is moved throughout the entire plant, including that below ground 
um, vegetation. So moving back to manual mechanical control, all of these methods, smothering, cutting, mowing, burning, foaming steam, all that's doing is really affecting the above ground part of the plant. It actually doesn't affect the root system at all. Whereas with chemical control, the herbicide can actually do its work on the entire part of the plant, which is how chemical control can be successful in um, eradicating knotweed. Um, so of course the use of chemicals or herbicides on plants um, is a highly regulated activity in BC on public property. Um, there are lots of regulations you have to follow and you have to have a, uh, an applicator that is specifically licensed to do this work. Um, you can see the top of the photo here. This is an example of the herbicide sign that my crew uses when we're doing work on public land. So there's all sorts of rules about notifying the public and including information about the treatment method on, on that sign. Um, and so essentially the targeted application application methods that are useful for knotweed include hand sprayer or a backpack sprayer, which you can see in the photo here. Um, because the knotweeds have hollow stems, stem injection is also a possible um, way that we can apply herbicide and also wipe on. So there's different ways to do that. It's essentially um, applying the herbicide directly to the plant's leaves. And so again, due to the extensive rhizome system, chemical control with herbicide is really the most effective treatment method for all four species of knotweed. Um, and herbicides are specifically designed um, to kill, kill plants. Um, also wanted to note that there's a residential pesticide applicator certificate. Our recommendation is that if you're dealing with knotweed on private property that you consult an expert or contractor to help you out with that. Um, but it is possible for you to learn um, information about how you can do this yourself by obtaining the pesticide applicator certificate, which is free. And there's all sorts of information online about what you can, what products you can use and, and what's allowed and what isn't allowed. And Lori will definitely include the link to all of that residential application information in the email as well. So here is a brochure available from CKIS. So it's a, a knotweed specific brochure for landowners and it's got basic information about prevention, control, restoration, and disposal. And it also includes a list of herbicide contractors and contract in contact information. And so again, this information will be shared as well. If you're dealing with knotweed on private property, this information will be very, very helpful for you. So there are a few other control methods that we sometimes turn to with invasive plants. Cultural control um, can often mean the use of grazing animals. So when it comes to knotweed, goats and cattle will graze newly emergent stems. Um, however, again, grazing doesn't control the root system. And so it's generally ineffective on knotweed. It, it wouldn't provide any sort of long-term control. And the animals themselves, the herd, can actually spread the infestation. So um, there are grazing animals that are really useful for other invasive plants, but unfortunately not knotweed. Um, biological control is the use of a highly host-specific predator. It's often some sort of insect. Um, but unfortunately, we don't have any biocontrol agents available in BC um, on knotweed yet. There is a little bit of research going on in the province. Um, so maybe at some point in, in a near decade, we may have some other tools available to us. But currently, biological control is not um, helpful for control of knotweed. So a few other considerations. When we're dealing with management around water, there are a lot of restrictions we need to follow. Um, especially if you're using herbicides. So there are a lot of regulations that govern the use of pesticides around waterways. And so that's something important to consider. Um, also residents with knotweed on your property should consult a professional. I mentioned that, that contractors can be really helpful. Um, and you know, they're, they're trained in how to deal with knotweed and they have um, applicators who have experience and you know, know what kind of products to use and, and know what kind of plan to um, set forth for, for private property. So it's definitely appropriate for the public or even stewardship groups to be reporting and monitoring knotweed, um, but it, you have to be really careful if you're wanting to manage it on your own property. So a little bit about disposal. Um, so on-site disposal, I, again, really, um, when we're talking about disposal, um, 
we're not recommending that people cut knotweed or mow it. And so you generally shouldn't have much biomass or plant material to deal with. Um, if you're using chemicals or herbicides to treat the plants, those treated canes or dead stems can simply be left on site to decompose. It's one of the advantages of using chemical control is that once the treatment has been applied, you actually don't need to touch the plant at all. You actually just leave all the stems in place and, and let them just simply die and decompose and, and do their work. However, if manual control is necessary, again, there might be a few particular circumstances where, where that might um, be used. Disposal on site is recommended due to the high risk of spread during transport. <laughs> so off-site disposal is not recommended. Um, if this is required, all the knotweed plant parts should be placed in transparent bags, just like in the photo there. Um, knotweed canes can get quite long, so they might have to be cut into smaller pieces in order to fit into the bag. And also note that there are no dumping fees for invasive plants at landfills or transfer stations in, in the Secus region. So that might be really helpful for other invasive plants that you're dealing with as well. So again, disposal is such an important issue, like what to deal, how to deal with all the stuff that we're collecting or treating. Um, it's really important with Notway that we don't dump garden waste in public parks, natural areas and roadsides. Really important for all of our garden waste and invasive species. It's actually illegal to dump in this way and there are hefty fines associated with those kinds of activities. Um, we also don't want to place knotweed in your household composter. It simply won't get up to a high enough temperature for a long enough period of time to really render all of that material dead. Um, so definitely don't recommend um, putting those into your, your backyard composter or, or heap compost. So just a note about developing land. I know this is a huge topic in my region. Oftentimes there's a knotweed infestation um, and there might be an imminent infrastructure project and people want to get in there and, and do some work um, and, and be managing the land. And so they always wonder what to do. So ideally, the knotweed is treated before any kind of building or excavation project. Um, you know, as many treatments or, or years of work you can get in before that work is done, the better chance you have of actually eradicating the knotweed. Um, if those kinds of things do need to happen and the knotweed isn't fully eradicated, if there's been some kind of machinery or excavation, the soil contaminated with knotweeds needs to be disposed of responsibly and you can contact the regional districts about um, soil disposal options. I know some of you on the webinar tonight might have really specific questions about the site that you're working on, especially with respect to developing the land. And that's something that I can help you with offline and certainly the CICA staff can, can help you as well. Sometimes a lot of the decisions that need to be made in those circumstances are really on a case by case basis where we would need to know the specific details about um, what we would recommend. So monitoring is essentially what we do after we've done a treatment of an invasive plant at a site. And, and really monitoring is important for any kind of work after you've been pulling or managing invasive plants. Um, but certainly with respect to knotweed, it's important for, for any of the treatment method you've been using, you have to monitor for many, many years after treatment. Um, even my own crew, we have um, essentially eradicated a site and been monitoring it for a few years. And even after year three or year four of having not seen any visible knotweed above the ground, um, suddenly, you know, we see a little knotweed stem pop up. And sometimes it's not even right at the site of the original infestation. It could be a couple of meters away from where the original infestation was. And so when you're monitoring or trekking back on the site, look really carefully around the edges of that initial infestation. Just, you know, take a quick look around the site and make sure that no knotweed is popping up. That's essentially the um, extent of what you need to do for knotweed. And um, this is, you know, more so required than, you know, most other invasive plants because knotweed is just so aggressive and, um, you know, can come back after many, many years. Um, and oftentimes when we've done um, invasive plant treatments, we think about what happens to the site after it's been eradicated, what we want to do.
do is restore the site. We want to ensure that the invasive plant doesn't come back or that another invasive plant doesn't kind of move in on that site. Um, and so restoration is our term for what we do afterwards, how we make sure the site is uh, uh, less susceptible to invasive plant invasion. And restoration activities with knotweed have to be carefully timed. Again, you kind of want to wait a few years to make sure that you've eradicated the knotweed. You don't want to invest a lot of money and time into installing plants or seeding um, if the knotweed is simply um, you know, going to come back because it hasn't been fully treated yet. So be aware of that rhizome system um, and it will take a long time to kind of die off and decompose. There are a number of resources that will be shared with you about what you would consider for your site afterwards. There's an eco garden plant list that has sites suitable for the region um, for gardens and that would be beneficial to wildlife and that would also pay attention to things like climate change and water and fire issues. Um, there's also a PlantWise program, which is a provincial program that has a lot of great resources to help you identify what the invasive species might be that could be growing in your garden with some alternative species that are non-invasive or native plants that would be a lot more appropriate to plant. And so lots of great resources out there for you to find the right plant for the right place um, that is, is not going to be invasive at all. A few other gardening best practices. So know what you grow. Don't just accept plants or seeds from people without knowing what they are. Of course, select non-invasive plants. And if you do have invasives, make a plan to get rid of them. Again, with not we today, we've talked a bit about this long-term commitment. Um, I have invasive plants on my property and you know, I can't get to them all in one weekend. I have to kind of make a plan for, you know, what's going to be my first priority and then what am I going to get to next year? And so as long as you have a plan for what you're going to work on next, um, that's, that's really the best case scenario. Um, contain your invasive plants if you have them or possibly uh, remove the flower heads before they seed. So if you have existing invasive plants or you're not able to manage them all at once, those are some techniques that you can use to try and prevent the, the further spread. Um, and when you're selecting non-invasive plants in the garden center, I encourage you to ask a lot of good questions of your, your garden center. Even take a list of um, some of these recommended plants to the, the center with you and be really suspicious of exotic plants or bulbs and seeds and potted material that are promoted as fast spreaders or vigorous self seeders or drought resistant, really easy to grow. Oftentimes that might be a clue that it's an invasive plant or the plant has invasive tendencies. So um, as gardeners, um, because some of these invaders are still readily available for sale in garden centers, we have to be really knowledgeable before we go. Um, and so knowledge that you've learned about invasive plants can be shared with others. I encourage you to share this information with your neighbors. One of the most common questions I get is, I'm dealing with my invasive plants, but it's my neighbor, right? Something's coming over the fence or my neighbor has knotweed and um, needs some help to deal with it. So you as landowners and um, as community members have the ability to share with others your knowledge about invasive species and, and spread the word and help people do the right thing um, for their property as well. Um, consult a regional expert for technical questions. Again, it's so important to get the right information for the right plant. And there's always somebody who can help you find the information you need. And I also encourage you to share your concerns with politicians. One of the limiting factors of the work that I do and that CECAS does is funding, right? We're always fighting for more funding to provide education on invasives, but also to provide treatment. So many of the groups like ours actually do treatment on um, government property and, and, and for lots of different agencies. And so the, the higher the budgets, the government um, agencies have, then the more work we're able to get done. Um, and if you see a need for a program or for a resource that doesn't currently exist in your municipality or in your community, then please bring that up with your local politician. Um, a little bit about reporting. So in the CCAS region, there's a reporting website there, or you can also send a report by email, and there's a phone hotline as well. Um, if you're outside the region, and for those of you listening to the Provincial Health Officer um, announcement today, we'll be able to travel throughout other regions this year in, in BC. 
Um, so you might see invasives in other parts of the province. And so there are a few different ways that you can report invasives there, especially not waiting to some of those high priority plants. There's a free app called Report Invasives. And you can see a screenshot of the app there. There's a little icon that you'd see wherever you download your apps from. And you can actually um, use the app on your smartphone to make a report in real time. And it'll capture the coordinates and you can even take a photo and um, put all the information about what you saw when you were actually at the site. You can also email the provincial government and there's also the conference conservation officer services hotline that you can call as well. And again, this information will be provided for you in the follow up email. And here is uh, our contact information. If you have specific information um, that you think that I can help you with, you're welcome to contact me after today. There's my direct email there and also my phone number. Um, and if you're contacting me and you are at the webinar today, please remind me that you were with me today. And also the CCAS information, they're probably your, your best resource for all things invasives. So maybe start with them. And if there's a particular question on knotweed that you think I can help you with, um, I'm happy to, to take that as well. And I would also like to acknowledge the financial assistance of the province of BC and the Columbia Basin Trust, which supports um, work like this from not only my council, but um, CCAS as well. Okay, great. Thanks, Tasha. So we're going to open up the floor to questions. So if you have a question, uh, type it in to the chat box. We have um, just a little over 10 minutes to, uh, to do some questions. So I'm just going to kick off with a question for myself. Um, I'm wondering if you can elaborate a little bit just about the disposal of non-treated not weed on site. Do you have any recommendations for where people should stockpile it so they don't start a whole new infestation? Like I've told people to like lay out a tarp so they're not starting anything. So any recommendations of a good stockpile place for non-treated sure. stocks? Yeah, I'm gonna pull out. So the document I recommended, the best management guide is really a digital resource, but I have one printed copy for myself, which I keep at my desk because I use it on an almost daily basis. So I'm going to go to the disposal section. Um, I know with a lot of large projects, um, they will often use um, a, a burial method, um, you know, where they're like digging many meters down and actually excavating the knotweed plant material and, and putting it in the ground. Um, however, for most regular people who are dealing with knotweed on private property, um, yeah, the best, the best thing to do is just, yeah, stockpile it maybe on like a tarp or something like that. Um, you know, I've seen situations where people have dug up knotweed and then left it on site. But if the roots have access to soil, they can actually continue growing. Um, and so you just want to be really careful that if you are having to manually control or dig up knotweed, that you really make sure that that material doesn't have any access to soil, that you stockpile it in a way um, that it, it cannot continue to survive at the site. So if that means, um, you know, piling it on some kind of concrete pad or a tarp or something like that um, until all of the plant material totally dies out, that's um, the best option. And again, if there's, if there's rhizome or root material in there, it's not gonna die in a few days or a few weeks. It may take months or even like a year or two to actually completely die. Okay, great. Thanks for clarifying that. Okay, we have a question about um, treating near water. So someone has a small patch, 50 canes, along the edge of a gravity system garden stream that supplies a small trout pond. Will, our, will herbicide contaminate the water and affect the fish? Pretty case, pretty site specific question. Yeah, yeah. So a couple of things there. So one of the restrictions is that in BC, um, pesticides cannot be applied within 10 meters of a water body. Now, the definition of a water body is actually a technical definition, but it's likely that the whoever was asking the question um, does actually have something that would um, qualify as an actual water body. Um, that 10 meter pesticide free zone can be reduced to one meter if it is being used on a, a noxious weed and if the product is, um, the active ingredient is a glyphosate. 
And so even for knotweed from the high water mark of a water body to that one meter mark, we cannot treat the herbicide. We can't legally do that under legislation. And so my best advice in these situations is often to do nothing. We don't have any good management tools for that, um, that period um, on the earth from you know zero from one meter. And so oftentimes people will try and treat up to the one meter, um, but currently in BC, we just don't have any products that we can use um, further to the one meter. And because we know that you know, pulling it or digging it or cutting it comes at such great risk and may not work anyway. Um, oftentimes my best advice is to just leave that section. And it's, it's true that in my region, there are entire swaths of creeks where there are one meters along the edges of the creek that have not been treated, but all the other knotweed has been treated. And so we hope at some point that we'll be able to, to treat that. So there's likely you know, parts of your infestation that can never be treated, um, at least not currently under, um, under legislation. Um, but I'll just address the part about um, you know, whether you know, if you could treat up to the one meter, you know, what happens to, you know, the water and all the other things. So there are a lot of different products that are, can be used on, on knotweed. So again, when you're talking to a contractor, these are the types of questions you want to ask, like, will there be any sort of residual effect? What kind of product are you hoping to use? You know, what's the long-term efficacy going to be? Um, most of the herbicide work that is done on knotweed in the province is use of glyphosate. It's certainly the main product um, an active ingredient that my crew is using. Um, and glyphosate is considered a non-persistent herbicide. So essentially it is deactivated as soon as it hits soil. It's specifically designed to, um, you know, be working on the plant material and, you know, has no other side effect of other, you know, plants in the area. And qualified contractors are really experienced at um, doing very, judicious use and targeted application of herbicide in a way that, um, you know, can safely be done, even if there are other plants around, um, you know, they're just specifically targeted and not. We, many, many sites that my crew works on are very, very small. And sometimes there could be things like salmonberry or ferns growing right around the site and we can safely treat just the knotweed. Um, of course, there are precautions that are taken, like we wouldn't do it if there were you know pollinators or birds actively in the area that would not be an appropriate time to treat but again qualified applicators are really experienced at um, you know knowing when it when it's safe and when it's appropriate to treat um, but generally yeah when there's a glyphosate product used there's really no residual impacts and um, it's not going to impact the the water because of you know the herbicide hasn't been sprayed in the water it's just been you know specifically targeted for the, the knowledge. Okay. So we have someone asking if over-the-counter Roundup would work on knotweed. It's a good, that's a really good question. So my best advice is to hire a contractor because contractors have access to products and equipment such as stem injectors and, you know, backpack sprayers and things that uh, the average citizen does not have access to. Um, however, if somebody is really keen um, or doesn't have any options to hire a contractor and they want to do it themselves and they have the right information, um, my best advice is to find the highest concentration um, of over-the-counter glyphosate product that you can, follow the label instructions, and um, good luck. It may work, it may not work. What um, contractors are using are, is a higher concentration and different products than what you can buy over the counter. And so it may not be very effective, um, but it's certainly, it's, it's worth a try if you have no other options. Okay. And just to stay on the herbicide, someone's asking if all herbicides contain glyphosate because um, they've heard this chemical has harmful effects on humans. I don't know if you can comment on that question. Yeah, so glyphosate is just one of probably hundreds of active ingredients that are contained in you know, pesticides and herbicides around the world. I am not a pesticide expert. Um, and so it totally depends on what product is being used. Glyphosate is a really common 
herbicide worldwide. Um, I, my experience with glyphosate is using it as a herbicide for the management of invasive plants. My understanding is that the use of glyphosate on invasive plants is such a small, small percentage of the overall glyphosate use around the world in agriculture, on golf courses, for just general weed control in a large um, variety of settings. It is one of the most widely studied, studied chemicals um, on the planet. And I encourage you to really source out um, good scientifically based information about glyphosate, because if you just Google glyphosate, um, you'll be bombarded with a lot of information and a lot of it is not accurate. And so you really wanna pay attention to what the source is. Um, and again, if you're wanting information about glyphosate specifically for management of invasive plants, um, you know, CECAS and organizations like myself are really the best, best places to go. Okay. And someone's also asking if herbicides are destructive to native or other plants. I think you touched on this a little bit about being a targeted maybe just a little bit more of an yeah. there. yeah so again it totally depends on the herbicide some herbicides will um, kill all broadleaf plants some herbicides will kill all plants and so it, it really depends what you're talking about um, and so yeah when applicators are specifically applying for the purposes of managing invasive plants they're specifically targeting those plants that that herbicide sign that i showed you one of the required fields on that sign is target invasive plants. So when pesticides are applied on public property, the contractor is required to use a sign like that. And one of the required fields is the target invasive plant. So people know, oh, it was the blackberry that was being treated in this area. Or, oh, it was a knotweed being treated on this area. And so with respect to management of invasives, it's a very targeted application. Um, that may not necessarily be true in other sectors where people might be spraying roadsides or railways for other purposes. They might be managing for all vegetation for safety purposes. But with respect to invasive plants, it's always um, very targeted. Usually at a site, it's like one target invasive plant. Um, I know here in our region, the knotweeds are um, a really high priority for management. But if there is Himalayan blackberry also at the site and it gets sprayed as well, um, then you know that, that sometimes happens. If there's other invasive plants that can also get treated at the same time, um, it's sort of a, a bonus. Okay. okay. And we have a few questions coming through and we get this a lot about that someone's living beside someone that has knotweed and it's starting to encroach on to their property. So someone's asking if there's any sort of vegetation barrier or structure that it would impede into into the property. Do you are you aware of anything like that that would oh my gosh so I, I really really feel for you one of the most challenging questions that I get is that question right there. There are a lot of what I would consider shared infestations in my region and sometimes it's really complicated. It could be part city property, part private property, part multiple private property and it's always such a challenge because the root structure is so extensive. I don't think um, a, a barrier would be um, much of a deterrent for the expansion of the knotweed. Really, the best case scenario is that everybody is treating their portion of the knotweed. And a big part of my job is connecting land managers to you know, come up with an agreement where that kind of work can be done because if one person is treating half of a knotweed infestation and the other person or the other land manager isn't, you know, the, it's, it's hardly even worth it to, to start on that kind of project. So my advice there would be to make friends with your neighbor and send your neighbor information about knotweed and talk about why it's in both of your best interests to do that. But it's really, really hard. And I know lots of cases where the landowner is absentee or the landowner is just not um, you know, willing to provide the treatment. And, and again, as community members, this is where you can come, um, you, know, you can express your concern about that to local government. So local governments, mm -hmm can enforce the Weed Control Act, but it's very, very rare all across the province for local governments to do that. There are a few in my region that will send information letters. Hey, we've noticed that not weed is on your property. Here's what you can do about it. But it's very rare that somebody would actually get 
uh, a bylaw notice saying you are required to manage your, your not leave. And so if that's important to you, or if you're running across this in your um, daily life, I encourage you to get in touch with your local government and you know, make a formal complaint about, you know, you want to make it easy for people um, to have to treat their not weight and you want to make it easy for folks like you guys who are on the call to do the right thing. Yeah. And I should let folks know that Aaron Bates is actually on the call, our executive director. So I'm going to direct this one to you, Aaron, if you can hear me. Here she comes. Hi, Aaron. So we have someone in Caslo um, just wondering, and maybe you can comment on the, the Ministry of Transportation right away program. And they're seeing some ministry folks actually mowing some knotweed that's in front of them. So mm -hmm. I will get their address, <laughs> but maybe you can just mention the Ministry of Transportation um, program on right of ways and also the efforts that we do to educate, um, you know, people that work on our roads that they're not mowing this knotweed. Yeah, absolutely. It's interesting to hear that. Um, so every year we connect with um, the road maintenance contractors in our region and provide them with basically a small workshop. Uh, and I would say more than 50% of that workshop is about knotweed and do's and don'ts and best practices around roadside management for the contractors. So they they have access to that information. However, I know what it was until Mike said, I got one of um, anyway, just to continue, that that education is provided, but it's you know it's always there's oh, new people coming on. I got a water. Um, so it's potential that that's, that information was just missed on the Caslow route, and um, that's something that we can follow up with. We do have good contacts at the contractor's office, so um, they're always interested. They are actually quite interested in improving their investment in invasive plant management, so uh, we can pass that along for sure. Okay, so did I just asked capture, to send Sorry, did that capture the question, Laurie? I didn't actually read it. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, I mean, he's having the same issue with it with the neighbor. It's being on the neighbor property. And I mean, we run into this all the time. And just to reiterate what Tasha said, like, definitely feel free to use. We have these resources because sometimes it's just an education thing, but definitely putting pressure on not just the ministry, but like regional, like people that are sitting on the regional district um, to let them know that this is a concern because in reality, it's in their best interest to protect their own infrastructure. They don't want this going around all the Kootenai. So Definitely mm -hmm. putting some pressure on local government and the regional district folks, directors. Um, we, we can tr we can work on this all together, hopefully. So that's that's kind of the best advice when dealing with. Unfortunately, we don't have any um, enforcement capability within CKS. We're we're education. Sometimes we wish we would, but it's just not the case. Mm -hmm. Sort of. <laughs> yeah, I have, a, I have a theory in my region that um, you know over the last ten or fifteen years, I've seen a real increase in our local government's commitment to dealing with invasive species and. I feel like, you know, once they have a really good handle on their knotweed and they're really comfortable with the status of their programs, then they might focus a little bit more attention on private property. So I think from a local government perspective, I don't work for local government, but I would imagine it would be a little bit tricky to get into a situation where, you know, they're issuing bylaw notices for private, you know, property when they're not even treating all of their own private property. And that's the case in my region. Some of our larger municipalities are doing a really great job, but nobody has enough money to treat all or not weed every year. So I feel like over a period of time, once local governments get a real handle on it and their programs get bigger and better, that then, you know, they'll start focusing on private property and it'll, it'll just, you know, kind of hopefully fall into place. I'm an optimist, I think, that, uh, that this will happen eventually. It'll be easier to, um, you know, compel people to do good work on private property. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Great. I can add to too, Laurie. Um, as Tasha mentioned, knotweed is a really high priority for crown land management in the province. Um, and so in our region, the Ministry of Transportation does want to and sort of aims to control knotweed to the greatest extent possible. But often, if adjacent landowners are not amenable to that treatment, then it doesn't happen on roadside patches. So if you have some on your property or it's like on the roadside and extending onto your property, uh, we would actually like to know about that because there's a potential of some, some support for that management. Okay, great. 
Well, it is 8.05 and I do believe we have covered all of the questions in here. So I just wanna say thanks to Tasha for um, lending us your expertise on this rather complicated topic. Um, and thanks to everyone that attended, just showing up, you're already proving that you wanna take action on this invasive plant uh, and that you care about the impacts and trying to eliminate them. So thank you so much. And just a reminder to check your inbox um, it might come through to your junk mail. Um, so just be sure you check that within the next couple of days. We will send you the recording, send you tons of resources. And if you are within the CECAS region, just remember that um, CECAS.ca is a, is a great message. So thank you so much, everyone. And I hope you all have an awesome summer now that restrictions are sort of lifted a little bit. Thank you so much. Thanks, everybody. Take care. Have a great night. Good luck with your not leave. <laughs> Thanks again to Tasha. Great, great time to get started on it. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Take care.